It's finally time to start talking about our first real concurrency and parallelism framework that we're going to cover in this course in detail, and that is the Java fork join framework. And we're going to talk about how you can use the Java fork join framework to process tasks in parallel. So the fork join framework has a pool of threads, both essentially platform threads and I won't say virtual threads, but lightweight threads that provide a high-performance, fine-grained task execution framework to do data parallelism in Java, to do object-oriented parallelism. And it's a parallel computing engine that's used by other higher-level frameworks, including parallel streams, including computable futures. You can also use it with reactive streams if you choose to. It doesn't necessarily come out of the box, but you can choose to do it that way. And it works by supporting a style of parallel programming that's optimized to solve problems using the divide and conquer pattern. And here's basically how this works. You probably know how this works already because you've learned about this in other courses. Hopefully your data structures or algorithms course or both. So if you want to solve a big problem or if you want to solve a problem, if that problem is small enough, then just solve it directly using some sequential algorithm. So that's the case where you just have a few things to do and you chomp on those things with one in one thread of control. Otherwise, if the problem is too big to be solved directly, then you want to split the problem up into independent parts, hopefully relatively equal sized. You then fork new subtasks to solve each of these parts. You then join all the subtasks together as they finish, and you compose a final so-called reduced result from all the sub-results that ran in parallel. So that's the basic idea of divide and conquer. And again, I suspect you understand that at a high level, at least from an algorithm point of view. Classic examples of algorithms that work this way would be merge sort and quick sort, where you break things up into chunks and then solve them concurrently, or could, could solve them in parallel. So there's three phases to this. The first is to split the initial task or data source up into subtasks. And the way this works is by forking. So you want to make these tasks be forked into smaller and smaller units. Ideally, the forking is done very quickly evenly, very efficiently. One of the ways we'll talk later about when or when not to apply these models is if the data set you're working with doesn't lend itself to even splitting or efficient splitting, then this paradigm may not be for you. A subtask only splits itself into more subtasks if the work is sufficiently large at that level. So when you reach a certain point, like when you end up with one element in the data structure that you're splitting, then you stop because you can't subdivide it any further. Kind of an obvious point, but uh, you, you actually have a lot of control about this, as we'll see later. The subtasks are then all run in parallel. Each subtask runs sequentially, but the culmination of them all runs in parallel. And this parallel processing, of course, is implemented by a number of layers in the stack. So the fork join framework is part of this. The job execution environment, which provides the threads, is part of this. The operating system kernel, which provides the lower level kernel threads, is part of this. And of course, the hardware, which provides the multi-core processing infrastructure, would also be a part of that as well. We, of course, primarily care about what the fork join framework is doing, but just be aware that there's other layers that are pitching in to make this all work. The subtasks run in parallel, usually on different cores. As the number of cores increases, you usually get a benefit, especially if you have your tasks that are designed to be embarrassingly parallel. And but always keep in mind that if, if for some reason you're transported back to 1990 and you only have one core, these approaches still work. They just may not give you much of a win. Uh, there are situations where you can have a win with a, a uh, fork join-like model in a single core processor if you have highly I.O. bound tasks and under the hood you've got a computer architecture that supports data processing with direct memory access that can run in parallel even though there's only a single core. So that's the way people used to get speed ups before we had multi-core processors. After all, the processing is done sequentially in each element and then, of course, in parallel in the aggregate. The results are combined together. The subtask results are joined back together again. And the join operation, as we will see later, appears to wait, but in fact, it doesn't really wait. It just pitches in and runs to do other processing. And when it finally gets the result it's expecting, it will return. And then you can take its result and use it for some other purpose, usually 
combining it with other subresults. Join, as we'll see, plays this role in executing subtasks. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about this in the context of something I call the Jiffy Lube method of cooperative processing. And we'll explain that metaphor when we get to that point. When all the joining is done, we finally take the final two subresults and we put them together into a final single result, which is just the culmination or the, the concatenation or amalgamation, depending on what you're doing, of all these intermediary results. And that's, that's what you end up with when you're all said and done with this model. Notice that join occurs in a single thread at each level. So joining always works by taking the results from two sub results and in a single thread joining them. And because of the way this framework is cleverly designed, there's typically no need for synchronization to take place during the joining phase. Now we'll talk later when we talk about parallel streams. There's this something called a concurrent collector which does in fact require synchronizers, but there's no joining, and we'll talk about that. That's a whole other, uh, whole other variant of this. But in general, the joining takes place in a way that does not re require application-level synchronizers. Now, under the hood, there's all kinds of clever stuff taking place using various compare and swap operations in the Java virtual machine, but you mercifully don't have to know, don't have to care about all that level of detail. So that's the end of the overview of the Java fork join framework. Needless to say, there's a lot more to it, but that will give you at least a high-level view of what's taking place.